Welcome to Introduction to Soil Health, the first video in our soil health series presented by Cargill and American Farmland Trust. In this video, Anna Teeter, Cargill Conservation Agronomist, will introduce soil types and textures, as well as how to evaluate what characteristics of your soil can or cannot be changed. NRCS Soil Health Specialist, Stephanie McLean will talk to us about properties of high functioning soils and show us how those soils perform in comparison to lower functioning soils in the slake and infiltration demonstration. Throughout the video, you will also be hearing from farmers in various stages of soil health management about what soil health means to them and their operation. has gained much momentum in the last decade, but with that came many definitions and interpretations of what soil health means. The USDA defines soil health as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. This definition speaks to the importance of managing soils so that they are sustainable for future generations. This is quite a broad definition, and for good reason. Soil health looks different all over the world. For example, rice growers or vegetable growers will view soil health differently than someone growing soybeans. For this series, we will be focusing on soils in the United States Corn Belt. We can think about the different qualities of soil in two main categories, inherent properties and dynamic properties. Some important inherent qualities include parent material, the rock and sediment that formed your soils, soil texture, the combination of sand, silt, and clay, and the slope of your landscape. These are aspects of your soils that you cannot change. On the other hand, we have dynamic properties or properties that change over time. In this series, we are focused on dynamic properties that can change uh, with management, including reduced tillage, cover cropping, cropping rotation, and nutrient management. When looking at dynamic properties that influence soil health, we look at soil organic matter, water holding capacity, infiltration, nutrient cycling, mineralization, and compaction. There are also several microbial soil tests being developed and researched to find ways to measure soil biological activity. Many of these require soil testing, and while I encourage you to get your soils tested, there are also on-farm indicators that can help you visualize the improvements in soil health. Soil health practices can take multiple years before seeing the advantages. This is why you should have a plan for the future and not just focus on immediate gratification. These concepts are important to both AFT and Cargill, and we want to make sure that your farms are around for future generations. That's why we're encouraging you to have a generational view or thinking of farming. What can be done now to have a positive impact later? Probably the most obvious thing I've noticed on, on my farms is I, I'm, I'm not seeing, you know, gullies in my fields. I'm not seeing um, the fodder washing off into the, the ditches on the side of the road. Um, you know, we are, we are seeing uh, the soil just become so much more mellow. And, and when you take a shovel and you put that shovel in the ground, it just sinks right in. When you open it up, it just looks so rich. It, it almost looks like chocolate cake, honestly. And the smell of it, the smell of that fresh soil is just, is just amazing. So our long-term goals is to reduce inputs, improve soils, and protect the environment. So our goal is to, if we can reduce some of our fertilization through using livestock manures or uh, nutrient recycling through cover crops or nutrient production through like legumes. So maybe we can look at various legumes to offset some of our nitrogen costs. You can physically see it. And um, I mean, my dad can attest to this too. He's, he's seen it and uh, it's just amazing uh, to actually see, see that difference in the soil. Soil health, what it means to me is improving the biological uh, aspects of the soil 
you know, the, the organic matter, the uh, earthworms, uh, you know, the, the microbes themselves. Some of the things we forgot about because we've always looked at soil tests as a chemical portion. Well, now I think it's taking and looking at that as the biological too. So soil health to, to me in our farm is, is improving the soil um, with a, both an economic aspect and you know, then the physical making the soil healthier. Some changes that we've seen is I, I feel like you know, we're, we're getting better aggregate stability from, from reduced tillage um, and, and the cover crop aspect of it. So that's been nice. I think we're getting a little bit better uh, water infiltration also from, you know, not disturbing that, that area. Soil health is defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a living, breathing ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. That's a pretty big definition when you think about it. So let's take a minute to break that down. So the first thing I want you to think about in that definition is continued capacity. When I say the term continued capacity, I'm meaning that soil is constantly renewing itself or it's able to recover from a disturbance that happens on the landscape. So that soil is continually taking care of itself. It has that continued capacity to recover over time. When I'm talking about function, I'm talking about the soil's ability to infiltrate, store, and release water back to the growing plant. I'm talking about the soil's ability to break down uh, residues and cycle nutrients so that those are available again for the plants that are growing the next season. I'm also talking about the, uh, the soil's ability to be physically stable on which we farm. And the last thing that we want to think about when we talk about soil function is that our soil is a home for millions upon millions of living organisms. And that is one of the most important functions that we want to think about today, is that soil is a home for other life. And when all of these functions are working together properly, we see resiliency in our ecosystem. Soil is a living thing and we need to treat it that way, as opposed to waking up every morning and thinking, what am I going to go out and kill today? What, what insect do I need to kill? What weed do I need to kill? What fungus do I need to kill? We need to think about how do we mimic nature? How did, how did nature take care of those problems? And then lastly, when we think about the fact that that soil can maintain or regenerate plants, animals, and humans, we have to acknowledge that our soil is a benefit to the plants that grow in it. Our soil, when it's functioning healthy, is a benefit to the animals and the organisms that live in, in, the, in that soil and on that soil. And that when that soil is functioning properly, it benefits us as well it, through the food that we eat and the soils that we farm. Everything we do try to mimic nature. You know, nature had it right, right? And, and uh, that's what we want to try to do is to mimic nature on our farm and get, get the soil working in sync, you know, with the environment. And I, we believe wholeheartedly that by doing that, um, we will not only have bountiful crops and good yields and, and good profitability per acre, but we'll be doing the right thing for the land as well. And, and you know, making that land the best it can possibly be for future generations. We also believe that by doing that, we are producing a higher quality, more nutrient dense um, product. And that translates to benefit for, you know, all of us, right? When we do the slake demonstration, the goal is to look at how that soil interacts with water. The most important thing that we need to have when we do our slake demonstration is our soil aggregates need to be air dried. We can't have soil aggregates that we collected from the soil that are still wet. We need to have dried soils. And once we take those dried soils and we put them in the slake tubes and we try to observe what's happening as that water is trying to flow into those aggregates. On the healthy soil, you'll see that that aggregate has bubbles coming out of it. 
because that water is pushing into that soil aggregate. And as that water is pushing into the aggregate, the air keeps pushing out of it. And you'll see all sorts of bubbles kind of bubbling out of that aggregate. And what we're seeing there is this equilibrium trying to establish of water flowing into that aggregate as the air is pushing out. On the other soil that we're looking at here, which would be our typical or, or our conventional system, what you'll start to notice is you'll see bubbles coming off of that aggregate, but as they're coming off, the soil doesn't hold together. Particles of sand, silt, and clay are actually exploding off of that aggregate and falling into the water column. And as those particles of sand, silt, and clay come into solution, you'll notice that that water column becomes cloudy. Those silts and those clays actually make that water cloudy. We're losing water quality there as those, as those soil particles go into suspension. As we look at these two soils in these slake tubes, you notice that they look very different. One is able to hold together under the pressure of water and allow that water to freely flow into that aggregate, while the other one is actually starting to fall apart. It's going into solution and it's becoming almost looking like a muddy clump hanging on that strainer on the top of the slake tube. These are really important things that we want to think about when we talk about soil health and function. You might be wondering how or why this is happening. I spent a little bit of time here talking about the physical characteristics of what we're seeing, but let's take a step back here and think about why this is happening. And that has everything to do with the soil organisms that live in our soil, that soil life, that habitat that's so important for this system. Soil aggregates are formed uh, with the sand, silt, and clays kind of binding to each other and the interactions of plant roots in the soil. And then the other key component in this system is the microorganisms that live in that soil. Our bacteria and our fungi, they exude what I like to refer to as biological glues. And they coat those aggregates with these biological glues, helping to make them water stable so that when they're in the water, they're able to hold together. Fungi also have hyphae or other filaments that grow around the soil particles and helping to hold them together. When we do the infiltration demonstration, we take two soils that are mapped as the same soil type but are under different management systems. And we're going to put those soils into containers and see how they interact with water when we rain on them. If you notice when we do this infiltration demonstration, at first when we put the soils into the containers, the soil that comes from our conventional tillage system, notice how dusty that soil is as we put it into the container. Those clouds of dust billow up from that soil as I put it into the container. In the no-till soil health cropping system, you don't see that same amount of dust. And even though this is just a demonstration, Imagine how this plays out over the entire landscape. Think about how dusty it gets in the spring when people are working their fields, all of that dust blowing across the landscape, or in the fall after harvest. When we have our no-till cover crop systems, there's much less dust that's being released uh, into the atmosphere. And when there's dust being released, you can be assured that there's carbon being released into the system as well. So notice when we rain on these soils, the soil that is the no-till cover crop field, our soil health system, that water is able to freely flow around those aggregates, finding pore spaces and other ways to get down into that soil profile as quickly as possible. In the tilled field, when that raindrop hit that soil surface, we start to get a lot of micro explosions. Particles of sand, silt, and clay are bouncing and jol jolting all over the place and very quickly, the surface of that container becomes plugged up and sealed, and the water can't infiltrate. And if you notice, that water is starting to build up in the container because it can't go down into the soil profile. There's no, there is no pore spaces. There's no way for that water to get into the soil. So instead, in this demonstration, it sits on the top of the container. In the real world, that's not what it would look like we would have some type of runoff or erosion in this type of situation, meaning that our topsoil would be lost. We would also possibly see pooling or ponding in depressional areas where all that soil and water then would flow to in that field. And that becomes a problem across that landscape. 
So this demonstration does a really good job of trying to show that interaction of how important infiltration is in our soil ecosystem and how a soil health management system that incorporates no-till and cover crops along with other key practices helps to allow water to infiltrate more effectively. While some soil features like type or texture cannot be changed, taking certain actions now to improve the function of your soil could offset long-term negative impacts on your farm. In the next video, the farmers you briefly heard from earlier will talk more about the backgrounds of their farms, where they are in soil health practice implementation, and how they manage their operation. Hit that subscribe button to be notified as soon as each new video drops. For more information on what you've learned in this video, contact your local SWCD or NRCS office, a local Cargill representative, check out the links in the video description for more resources, or go to farmland.org for information about American Farmland Trust. Thanks for watching. See you next time.